And I'm so honored and glad that we have Robin speaking to us tonight. And I pray that the God will strengthen you yes. to deliver what he wants to speak through you to us. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I do have a cold. My voice sounds a bit odd. But before I do, I'd like to pr remember some of the things we've mentioned in the past that we should pray for. Not up there. Do uh, you remember we, Brian mentioned Dan last week? I've mentioned Bill beforehand who's totally lost. Um, the people, chaplains, who if they speak about Jesus going into the prison, they're not allowed to preach anymore. So let me, first of all, pray for those things before I start. Our Father, we bring before you the broken, the lost, those who desperately need to surrender themselves to you. And we bring before you too, Father, those who long to live for you and are silenced by our government that seems to do anything it can yes. to silence yes. you and your word Holy. and your son. Yes. Oh, our Father, as we look tonight at yourself and who you are and another part of who you are, we thank you that you are the almighty God who sees. Amen. So let us look now. Thank you, Father. Amen. So tonight I want to speak about the God who sees. And the names of God are many. I know that there are at least 70. Some, some uh, commentaries say there are more than that. But these are the ones that we have mentioned so far and talked about, and they all are all amazing, if we think about it. They show the mightiness of God, his righteousness, that he will provide for us, that he is our banner, that he heals, that he is our judge. But I, tonight, want to tell you two different stories let me begin with a story that you all know. Before there was any universe, there was God. Now we know that. He then created a beautiful world and a man and a woman to live in what we know as the Garden of Eden. All was good. Then, as we know, the snake twisted the words of God and basically told Adam and Eve that God was not to be trusted. Genesis 3, 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now we know that Adam listened to Eve, and against God's express command, they took the fruit. So, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now we know the consequence of not trusting God, death. It is what God said would happen. But the world makes, as we know, the world makes all sorts of ways to pretend. Oh, they're up in heaven, they're looking down. People that haven't got a clue about Jesus. But they do this. We have to twist to make it easy for people to not realise that without Christ, death is death. But it is inevitable. My Christian father, bless his heart, 
often said that he didn't fear death, but he did fear dying. And, my, and God was very good to my father. He got out of the car, he said he was having a heart attack and he dropped dead like that. He did not have to fear dying. He died immediately. Now, I want to tell you another story. This other story happened about 2,000 years after Adam and Eve. This story is about another man and another woman. I'm talking about Abraham. Early in Abraham's life, God had promised Abraham that his offspring would form a great nation, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonours you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, he renewed this promise later in Genesis 15.5. And he, God, brought him, that's Abraham, outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number the stars, then he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. But, as we know, after the renewed promise, ten more years had gone by and Sarah had still had no children. Abraham's nearly 86 now, there aren't too many people of 86, Charlie Chaplin did. And here he is encouraged by Sarah to doubt God as the serpent had done to Adam and Eve earlier. Doubt God. And we know that Sarah suggested that he should sleep with her Egyptian servant Hagar and thus, in a sense, force God's promise to be fulfilled. She even blames God by saying, God has prevented her from bearing children in Genesis 6 2. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. And instead of remembering the promise of God, he listened to Hagar. Hagar became pregnant and she then has disrespect and scorn for Sarah. Sarah complains to Abraham about Hagar's attitude and he says to his wife, do whatever you want with the woman, Genesis 6.16. But Abraham said to Sarah, behold your servants in your power, do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. So Sarah is kind, Sarah is mean, Sarah is jealous, and Hagar flees. So Hagar becomes a runaway. She heads back to her homeland of Egypt, Genesis 16. And here is the exciting part of the story in Genesis 16, 7 to 10, which should be up, Andrew. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, Egypt, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from? Where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. And you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Do you know what the name Ishmael means? God will hear. Isn't that amazing? Even Ishmael, God will hear. Now we come to the new name that we are talking about tonight. But I think I wanted to set up the scene of the fact that Adam and Eve had not listened and trusted God. 
Sarah and Abraham had not listened and just trusted God. And so this is what's happening. So now the angel of the Lord finds her and she is amazed. Gobsmacked is what we'd say nowadays. So she called the name of the Lord in verse 13, who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bia Lahomar Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And the meaning in Hebrew, the well of him that lives and sees me. Just to emphasize this, he, you are a God of seeing, El Roy. This is the one we're looking at tonight. And do you realize that this is the only mentioned, this is only once mentioned in the whole of scripture? And it's made and named by a foreign woman. And she gives this very special name to God. You are a God of seeing. I know that last week Brian speak, spoke about the other side of this where God is our shepherd. Both of them are beautiful, different understandings from what we've looked at so far of God, the gentle side of God. And we often put those aside and forget that. Because sometimes in dark days, it is the one fact that we hang on to. It's the name El Roy, God who sees, God who hears. Aren't we glad that he sees and hears? And here he was, seeing and hearing a foreign, runaway woman who was frightened and scared and had been used badly. I want to tell you of a time when this was very important to me. Many years ago, we had already approached a mission to go to Ethiopia. I'd been in Adelaide for a few days at a conference, and the speaker there challenged everybody, read Proverbs one chapter a week and you'll be fine. So on January the 1st, I started to read Proverbs chapter 1. And... Um, it says, well, don't put it up yet, Andrew. We had believed that this was God's call for us to go to Ethiopia. But when I read Proverbs 1 verse 8, it says here, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Now, my mother was an invalid. And my father had been fairly vocal about the fact that he was happy for us to be missionaries, but he wasn't happy for us to A, to go to Abyssinia, which is what he only ever called Ethiopia, and we weren't going out with his favourite mission. So when I read this verse, it was though an angel came to me, like he did to Sarah, and I, my heart said, God, I need my parents' blessing. When I came back from the conference, the lady next door came in with a letter that her young son had taken out of our letterbox and he'd torn it to tiny pieces and he'd scattered it in the vacant allotment opposite our home. Barry and I spent ages putting that jigsaw letter back together. But we did. It took a long time, I can tell you. Sticking little bit, does this fit here, does this fit there? It was a letter from my mother in which she had written that she had always wanted to be a missionary and she was thrilled that we were going overseas. God saved that precious message from my mother in spite of the fact that it was torn to pieces. But I remember saying to God, well, that's a blessing from my mother, but Dad's a hard nut to crack. Would God worry about an answer to my request for a blessing from my dad? It came a couple of weeks later. 
in a letter with a cheque for $500, which nowadays would be $4,500. And he said that he hoped it would help in our work in Abyssinia. He never ever called it Ethiopia. But for the rest of my life and my time, I, now I want to encourage us to realise that in the little things, God is there in the dark, dark days. In preparing for today, I've read quite a bit of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a rotten time. He was thrown into a deep well, which was meant to hold water, but was mud, and he was sunk into the mud. He was finally rescued by an Ethiopian called Ebed Melek. The king ripped his the pieces of his scroll to pieces that his friend Barak had written, so it had to be done again. The Israelites were against him. His own people were against him because he kept on pointing out how bad they lived and how they had gone so far from God that they were not taking notice of God's ways. They promised something, then they changed. They promised something, then they changed. He spent years and years pleading with them to come back to God. But in spite of rejection and ridicule, he always knew God heard and saw. He was probably stoned to death in Egypt by his own fellow Israelites. And Jeremiah, these are some of the promises and some of the words that come out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1.5 Behold, I formed you in the womb. I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then he could also say in Jeremiah 12, But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and you test my heart towards you. Those, they are amazing words from a man who had a terrible life. And in Jeremiah 23, later on, he says, Who can hide in secret places? so that I can't see them. We can't hide from God. So Jeremiah and his friend Barak, who rewrote everything that he'd done, stayed faithful to the end. They knew that God cared and saw. Now, the Lord, our own Lord, and I've basically stuck to the Old Testament because basically people don't think about the Old Testament, but in Matthew chapter 6, our own wonderful, fantastic Lord says... Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Isaiah preached of times of terrible judgment and also of great prosperity, but with great promises from God. Isaiah 41. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And even when it was dark for Isaiah, he didn't give up. He trusted God. He kept on saying in 43, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. And of course, we all know the wonderful passage in Isaiah 53, which foretells the coming of our Lord. And our friend King David had so many ups and downs, but this is what he learned about God in the hard times. Psalm 30. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. And I'm sure that the following is an especial comfort as we all have days when our spirits are crushed, our hearts are broken, and nobody understands. And Psalm 34 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. God is not far away. He is present all the time with us, as he was with Hagar. 
And this next one is in the present tense. It is a promise for always. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And again, we are foolish. I think if we do not realise that we desperately need God in times of deep distress or if we think that Christians don't have times of deep distress, I would encourage, encourage all of us to reach out to him in our desperate times, but not to feel a failure or that we have failed. He is there for us. Psalm 147, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And... If we go on to Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. The Lord himself said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I live with you, I, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be... There's more I could say, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stop there. Just to make the comment and the assurance and the assertion that in the bad times, in the hard times, in the down times... God is there with us, not just in the good times, as he was with Hagar, as he has been all down through the years with Jeremiah, with Isaiah. He is always there. So that is all I feel I need to say tonight, but... He is a wonderful God and he loves us even in the down times. The God who sees us.